<clears throat> excuse me. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 28th of the third month on our Creator's calendar, the 13th Sabbath of spring, the last one of the season. And it happens to line up with June 8th, 2024, on the Gregorian calendar or the Little Horns calendar, if you will, the one who thinks to change times and laws, right? But anyways, we're gathered today and we are going to cover a special treat. This is a part of what is called the Apostolic Constitutions. It's found in a larger set of writings called the Anti-Nicene Father's Writings or the Anti-Nicene Patriarch's Writings, which is a 10-volume set that's supposed to be all the writings that took place before 325 AD. It is not necessarily accurate in all of that. It has some stuff that was before then. It has some stuff that was tampered with. And it has some stuff that never even existed in reality until it was just thrown in. So you really have to sift through a lot of stuff there. But one thing that I will mention, it is the absolute proof. It is the physical evidence in writing of what you can read of the Besora, of what happened with our Mashiach when Yahushua was handed over to the Romans by apostate Yahudim, how they mocked him, put a, a robe on him, pretended like he was a king and served and worshipped and beat him, mocked him, spit on him, reviled him, and then, you know, did everything else. That set of writings, along with what you can call the Bible, the different translations, the Latin Vulgate in particular, but the newer translations in a echo of that, if you will. Um, it's what all these represent. It's what they've done to the truth, how they've made him unrecognizable, right? The things that we've been trying to cover little by little every week. So if you haven't been following along, highly encourage you guys to check out the Sabbath studies we have in our scripture study section. But if you're not new to this, then you'll be seeing this more and more as we go. It's just going to keep opening up. But right here, this is a treat in what is Book 7 of the Apostolic Constitutions on the day of the resurrection of Yahuwah, Yahushua, our Mashiach, the Sabbath, right? It is the most important appointed time. So with that, I'll just go ahead and get to reading, okay? This is a Facebook post. I'm, these are comments from me. I'll go ahead and start right here. It says, I have found this to be very profitable reading and thinking on on Shabbat. Did you know that Yahuwah's Yom is the Shabbat? This is falsely named the day of the Lord and wrongly believed to be the first day of the week, when in reality it is the seventh. It is the most important and most often rehearsed appointed time, and it is a foreshadow of the millennial reign which again, we're going to be like messengers, not doing our own pleasure, having relations with women at those times. That These are facts for those that will be like them. You can either accept the truth or argue against them, but I wouldn't argue against things with multiple witnesses, right? So how we ought to assemble together and to celebrate the festival day of our Deliverer's resurrection. This is chapter 30 of book 7. On the day or yom of the resurrection of Yahuwah, that is Yahuwah's yom, assemble yourselves together without fail, giving thanks to El and praising him for those loving kindnesses Elohim has bestowed upon you through Mashiach and has delivered you from ignorance, error, and bondage, that your offering may be unspotted and acceptable to Eloah, who has said concerning his Yahad Kahal, Yahad united into one, right? And then Kahal is assembly or congregation. This word Yahad Kahal is used throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it was perverted by the Romans and translated as Catholic Church. 
They first tampered with these things in a usage that might have been legitimate by Ignatius of Antioch, who was a legitimate overseer. And if you ever take the time to compare the longer versions of his letters with the actual contents of the Apostolic Constitutions and the Epistles and other writings, you'll find them to be wonderfully in agreement 99.9% .9 of the time. And the only points where there's any issue with the longer versions is where they, of necessity, tampered with the things that were condemning the Nicolaitans, because that's who he was exposing in Antioch. Just for reference for anyone who's not familiar, Ignatius of Antioch was a martyr around seven four, no, around seven one oh seven AD rather, and within seven years, rather that eighth year in one fifteen AD, you had the destruction of Antioch the first time in judgment by the righteous judgment of our Maker for what the Nicolaitans had done since his martyrdom and their taking over the area. You can read about the historical facts of what was going on <clears throat> in that area at the time of the destruction in detail in what's called the Antichrist for Dummies video series on YouTube by the YouTube channel ChristmasIsALie.com. I highly recommend them. Not everything's perfectly accurate. They actually do not have any regard in a good light of Ignatius of Antioch but everything they quote is from the corrupted, shorter versions of his letters that promote Nicolaitanism, which was the whole reason why they were corrupted. However, the evidence of both writings is right there for anyone to pursue in the 10-volume set, which is why I mentioned it. And you can see the one is beautiful and the other one is garbage. Anyone with reason can determine that. And you can determine that one fully in line with Scripture and one is obviously not. But to continue, a lot of people will see Catholic Church when they read these things, and it completely throws them off. And I don't want people to be discouraged like that. I had a conversation with some brothers on here not too long ago, or our fellowship here, brothers and sisters, and I made the comment that if I had not studied the Dead Sea Scrolls, if I had not been familiar with the community rule and the Damascus document and the laws that they were keeping as covenant believers outside of the cities in the wilderness at that time, I would not have easily accepted the Apostolic Constitutions. But after I'd read those and been familiar with them, as soon as I read this, it was just like, oh, there was just a Catholic veneer on this amazing treasure. And it was the fullness of what you can read right there in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but without the added bonds of transgression. <clears throat> we'll get to that more in time as well. Very soon, it's in Exodus, and we're almost there. It says, Who has said concerning his Yahad Kahal united into one assembly, In every place shall incense and a pure offering be offered unto me, for I am a great king, says Yahuwah Shaddai. And my name is wonderful, paleo, among the nations. Do you first ordain overseers worthy of Yahuwah, and elders and ministers, pious men, righteous, meek, free from the love of money, lovers of truth, approved, kadosh, not acceptors of persons, who are able to teach the word of piety and rightly dividing the doctrines of Yahuwah. And honor such as your fathers, as your masters, as your benefactors, as the causes of your well-being. Other places go into detail. You're not to call any man father, but even the Dead Sea Scrolls meant that you, you're to treat the guardian of the communities is like a father to those that are in it right so that's the the job of the overseer in the renewed covenant it's the same transition reprove one another not in anger but in mildness with loving kindness and shalom 
Observe all things that are commanded you by Yahuwah. <clears throat> be watchful for your life. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and you like men who wait for their master, when he will come, at evening or in the morning, or at cock crowing, or at midnight. For at what hour they think not, Yahuwah will come. And if they open to him, Ashrei, happy, are those servants, because they are found watching. For he will gird himself and will make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Luke 12, 35 and 37, and Mark 13, 35. That word Ashrei we talked about before, but it means to be happy, confirmed, authenticated, walking straight and strengthened, okay, and to be Baruch or blessed. <clears throat> Watch therefore and pray that you do not sleep unto death, for your former pleasant deeds will not profit you, if at the last part of your life you go astray from the true amuna, which is belief, trust, and trustworthiness, right? Like faith and faithfulness. An example of this would be in Noah's children. For 350 years after the flood, they kept the festivals, the remembrance days laid down by their father, but after his death, they went apostate, and their all their pleasant deeds, all their none of that profited them because they went astray in the last parts of their life, and all the chaos of uh, ancient history is the effect of that. <clears throat> For, and here is a part that has been slightly tampered with, because it promotes the Jesuit futurist estichology of a future little horn that's going to appear or a future anti-Mashiach, if you will, and that is the office of the Bishop of Rome, and it has been since at least Sixtus the Third in 382 AD. So these are historical facts that you can also learn about in the AC or the Antichrist for Dummies. Excuse me. It says, for in the last days, false foretellers shall be multiplied and such as corrupt the word, and the sheep shall be changed into wolves and love into hatred. Remember, the wolves come from Rome. If you don't know, we'll get to that again, but Rome, Romulus, and Remus were weaned on a, a she-wolf, which, while literally true, this she-wolf is also a euphemism in Rome for harlots and they're the mother of harlots is what they are the wolves in sheep's clothing are those roman infiltrators that we've had literally there's evidence that we can cover as far back as 1551 where they were exposed as infiltrating protestant organizations colleges and um, other things to take over and those are the wolves in sheep's clothing that came in where the hirelings are afraid of and flee from, right? But anyways, the, the sheep shall be changed into wolves and love into hatred. For through the abounding of inequity, the love of many shall wax cold. For men shall hate and persecute and betray one another. And then shall appear the deceiver of the world, the enemy of the truth, the prince of lies whom Yahuwah Yahushua shall destroy with the Ruach of his mouth, who takes away the wicked with his lips, and many shall be offended at him. But they that endure to the end, the same shall be delivered. And then shall appear the sign of the son of Adam in Shamayim. It's Yeshiyahu 11.4 and Matith Yahu 24. And afterwards shall be the voice of the trumpet of the chief messenger, and in that interval shall be the revival of those that were asleep. And then shall Yahuwah come, and all his Kodeshim with him, with a great concussion above the clouds, with the messengers of his power. And then every one of these references you see with these brackets is what I've added myself. Everything that is not in those was already here, so it had Matith Yahu 1627. 
But for more references of this time and what's going to happen right here, you can look at Hanok chapter 1, Yahuda chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, and Revelation 19, 20, verse 6. It's all covering that same general time frame. Part of what we can read in the recognitions of Clement is an explanation of Kepha on what we can do with the words that we have now to ascertain whether they are truly the words of the foreteller of truth. And then once we've ascertained that, to believe them without question. One of those things is that you do not put things first that are last or put things that are last or that are first, or you, you do not switch the order of events as he's established them meaning he came at an appointed time he's going to return there will be a thousand year reign satan will be released there will be a final judgment with fire and then the renewed creation after the great white throne judgment and no more tears you can't mess around with that order and then have it be legitimate right that's what that's talking about and another one is that you don't take the things that are true that were given and add things that are not to it, which is tragically what has been done to qu quite a bit of all of his word. And once you've ascertained what those things are that have literally been the flame of the truth by Rome, then you can determine what is not of him and what is. For example, the fact that the titles like the Lord and G-O-D are used all over in place of the name above every name and the word for Elohim, which is attributed to the name of our creator because it's used in as a title for him and people blaspheme using it. So this is also in the words of the recognitions, right? But back in back on point here. You can find reference there in all these places. And it says, <clears throat> with the messengers of his power in the throne of his kingdom, Malkuth, right? To condemn the adversary, the deceiver of the world, and to render to everyone according to his deeds. Then shall the wicked go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous shall go into life eternal. To inherit those things which eye has not seen, nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man, such things as El has prepared for, for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2.9 And they shall rejoice in the kingdom of El, which is in Mashiach Yahushua. Since we are vouchsafed such great Barak oath or blessings from him, let us become his supplicants and call upon him by continual prayer and say, <clears throat> our eternal deliverer, the king of Elohim, who alone are Shaddai and Yahuwah, so who alone are almighty and he who causes it to be, the El or the power of all beings and the power of our set apart and perfect fathers and of those before us, the El of Abraham and of Yitzhak and of Yaakov who are merciful and compassionate, long-suffering, and abundant in loving kindness, to whom every heart is naked, and by whom every heart is seen, and to whom every secret thought is revealed. To you do the inner beings of the righteous cry aloud. Upon you do the expectations of the set-apart ones trust. You father of the perfect, you hearer of the supplications of those who call upon you with uprightness, and who know the supplications that are not uttered. For your providence reaches as far as the inmost parts of mankind, and by your knowledge you search out the thoughts of everyone. Sorry about that, of everyone. And in every region of the whole earth, the incense of prayer and supplication is sent up to you. You who have appointed this present world as a place of combat to righteousness, 
and have opened to all the gate of chesed, or loving kindness, and have demonstrated to every man by implanted knowledge and natural judgment and the admonitions of the Torah, how the possession of riches is not everlasting, the ornament of beauty is not perpetual, our strength and force are easily dissolved, and that all is vapor and vanity, and that only a tov conscience of belief unfeigned passes through the, the midst of the Shamayim, and returning with truth takes hold of the right hand of the joy which is to come. And withal, before the promise of the restoration of all things is accomplished, the inner being itself exalts in expectation and is joyful. I, right here is the key for how you can, the only way to have true joy in your life, if you take the time to think about it. You can read in Ecclesiastes and through the Proverbs that beauty and vain and, you know, vanity, riches and things, none of these things are meaningful. They don't last and continue. But what does continue forever is our creator and the promise he gave us of an, a, a life after this. And only a, a clean conscience by taking hold of the truth that came down from above can bring you true joy for the expectation of what you have in the life to come. I pray everybody really gets that. Any other type of joy is fleeting. For from that truth which was in our forefather Abraham when he changed his way, you guided him by a vision and taught him what kind of state this world is. And knowledge went before his belief, and belief was the consequence of his knowledge. And the covenant did follow after his belief. For you said, I will make your seed as the stars of Shemaim, and as the sand which is by the seashore. Moreover, when you had given him Yitzach, and knew him to be like him in his mode of life, you were then called his El, saying, I will be an El to you, and to your seed after you. Bereshit 26.3 And when our father Yaakov was sent into Mesopotamia, you showed him Mashiach, and by him spoke, saying, Behold, I am with you, and I will increase you and multiply you exceedingly. And so you spoke to Moshe, your steadfast and set-apart servant, at the vision of the bush. I am he that is, right? I am Yahuwah, that is my name forever, and my zakar, or memorial, for generations of generations. Exodus or Shemot 3, 14 and 15. <clears throat> You great protector of the posterity of Abraham, you are Baruch forever. You are Baruch Yahuwah, the king of ages, who by Mashiach have made the whole world, and by him in the beginning reduced into order the disordered parts, who divided the waters from the waters by a firmament and put into them the Ruach or a Ruach of life who fixed the earth and stretched out the Shemaim, and disposed every creature by an accurate constitution, not evolution. For by your power, Yahuwah, the world is beautified. The Shemaim is fixed as an arch over us, and is rendered illustrious with stars for our comfort in the darkness. The light and the sun were begotten for days and the production of fruit, and the moon for the diversity of seasons, by its increase in diminutions, and one was called night and the other day. Yet as for the sea itself, who can possibly describe it, which comes with fury from the ocean, yet runs back again, being stopped by the sand at your command? And remember, the seed of Abraham is like the sand by the seashore, a parable, if you think about it. For you have said, thereby shall her waves be broken. Job 38.11 You have made 
all or you have also made it capable of supporting little and great creatures and made it navigable for ships then did the earth become green and was planted with all sorts of flowers and the variety of several trees and the shining luminaries the nourishers of those plants preserve their unchangeable course and in nothing depart from your command there's many that say that the luminaries are apostate or go wayward contrary to his will but i've never read anywhere that it says that here Hanok, and other places they don't mention that it mentions it that the people would attribute these things to mighty ones and go apostate which we see the evidence of historically as a fact but what you see above where the luminaries are the things that are going on there is no power greater than the father of lights who has command over them <clears throat> you never find anywhere in the written word where anyone can do that all right satan comes as a as a messenger of light but he comes as a deceiver there there's pictures there okay so everything that we see above is intentional is my point and you can find the evidence for that all throughout revelation in the antichrist for dummies videos where he points out the signs in the skies and the things that were mentioned in revelation and the corresponding events in history ob willing that will make more sense to people but he's the one that has them in the course that they're at and they don't deviate from his command another witness for this is father who is in shamayim let your name be set apart let your kingdom come let your desire be done on earth as it is in the shamayim already established there will be here so <clears throat> ob willing that helps everyone in that uh, that has any doubts about that it says even so where you bid them there do they rise and set for signs of the seasons and of the years making a constant return of the work of men afterwards the kinds of the several animals were created those belonging to the land to the water to the air and both to air and water and the handcrafted hokma of your providence does still impart to everyone a suitable providence that's it artificial in the version that i have on hand but if you look up what artificial means it's handcrafted and the hokma from elohim is literally his right hand or arm which is our mashiach the handcrafted or artificial hokma of his providence that does still impart to everyone a suitable providence literally speaking of our mashiach so that's why i use handcrafted instead of artificial there it has more sense in a applicable way for believers we think artificial is a bad thing today we don't know what it actually means etymologically so so for as he was not unable to produce different kinds so neither has he disdained to exercise a different providence towards every one which i had mentioned to you all in the different way that even as believers are considered to be bearing the fruits of the ruach and you have different types of fruits on vines and trees and a variety of things and these fruits are all produced in different ways they have different means of having growth and nourishment from seed to fully ripened and each one of these is the unique way of providence that a believer can be brought to the truth for all the different kinds that we have look at the variety in, in nature that's his loving kindness to mankind there is one way but his providence and his means of bringing us to fruitfulness are many so something to be grateful for and at the conclusion of the creation you gave direction to your hokma and formed a reasonable creature as the citizen of the world saying let us make man after our image and after our likeness there is sheet 126 and have exhibited him as an ornament of the world 
and formed him a body out of the four elements, those primary bodies, but had prepared a nephesh out of nothing, and bestowed upon him his five senses, and set over his sensations a mind as the conductor of the inner being. For anyone who's followed along, um, aside from the lady Barbara O'Neill, who I believe is a Seventh-day Adventist, and she does a wonderful job with her ministry of healing, um, branching out from that in the uh, Misty Mountain Health Retreat and Life Resort that she's done. She's had over 20 years of stuff doing that kind of thing, right? But before that one, there's also another doctor, a female doctor from Zimbabwe, who she mentions a book I have by a, a pastor. It's called A More Excellent Way by Dr. Henry Wright. And she's actually written her own book where they talk about how I believe her book is called Sanctification or Healing Begins with Sanctification of the Heart. And all of these are premised around his word being true. And literally, our violation of it is what causes health issues in every capacity. So, long story short, um, in those, like the doctor from Zimbabwe, she mentions that the mind and soul are one and the same. When, if you look at this word, nefesh is not the same as mind. If you look at the Greek words for here, what's being used there, they're not the same words either. And you can see that the one a physical thing was meant for a purpose to be the conductor of the soul. It is not the soul itself because the soul is in the blood. Literally, it says my the life is in the blood. If you look at that word, it's nefesh. And it's the nefesh is what we would call that living thing that exists beyond your your cells that talks to them that can change the dna with epigenetics that it even continues on after you're dead that that is a representation of like what the nefesh is it's in the blood it, it's everywhere that the life is that the oxygen goes through so but anyways they have things that they might mention that are not always in line with what is in the full body of what is true but the things that they share are amazingly in line with the full body of scripture aside from little points here and there and you can usually tell if someone has his name wrong there's going to be some doctrine wrong elsewhere it's just it's a fact that is if you pay attention i don't it doesn't mean that if you have his name right you're going to be perfect but it's if you have his name right it is a gift it is a treasure. It is a gift of his Ruach to be able to comprehend that correctly. So I don't want you to discredit that. But it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be perfect in everything. However, when you don't have his name correct, there is always some perverted doctrine because he is the truth. It, it can't be otherwise. Some people might find that hard to believe, but once you really, once you really know who he is as the literal word, and these things are literally true, you cannot be contrary to himself. It's going to really scare you, and then it'll really get you like a smelling salt. It'll wake you up to reality about how these things really, really function. Okay? But back on point. And besides all these things, Yahuwah Elohim, who can worthily declare the motion of the rainy clouds? the shining of the lightning, the noise of the thunder, in order to the supply of proper food and the most agreeable temperature of the air. Yet, when man was disobedient, you deprived him of the existence which should have been his reward. Even so, you did not destroy him forever, but laid him to sleep for a time, and you by oath called him to a resurrection and loosened the bond of death, you reviver of the dead, through Yahushua Mashiach, who is our expectation. Greater you, Yahuwah Shaddai, and great is your power, and of your comprehension there is no number. Our Creator and Deliverer, rich in benefits, 
long suffering, and the bestower of chesed, or loving kindness, who does not take away your deliverance from your creatures. That's another thing, too. There's a lot of people and a lot of um, fear mongering going on, saying that you're no longer human. And I use that with air quotes and disdain because. If you know what the word human means, you would never call yourself that. But, um, and it was an encyclical by the Little Horn that it said, it is a requirement that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. So if you're a human, you, you must be subject to him because the word human is a creation in legal terms for a, uh, not a man, basically, but for the reprobate who is incapable of receiving the things of the Ruach of Elohim, or what scripture calls the natural person, which the statutes of all municipal codes apply to only, not a man, just for context. <clears throat> it says, but back on point, they say that this gene therapy, uh, mRNA thing, made people not men and women, and they're now patented, but our Mashiach told his emissaries to go preach his Basora to every creature under the Shamayim. And he said, he who, he who believes and repents, right? He who believes and is immersed, the same will be delivered. And that's the one that's going to be in his kingdom. So it doesn't matter. These things don't matter. It's do you hear his word and will you love him? That's what's important. It says, for you are good by nature, and spare sinners, and invite them to repentance. For admonition is the effect of your bowels of compassion. For how should we abide if we were required to come to judgment immediately, when after so much long-suffering we hardly get clear of our miserable condition? The Shamayim declare your dominion, and the earth shakes with earthquakes, and hanging upon nothing declares your unshaken steadfastness. The sea raging with waves and feeding a flock of 10,000 creatures is bounded with sand, as standing in awe at your command, and compels all men to dry out. How great are your works, Yahuwah! In Chokmah have you made them all. The land is full of your creation. Again, the sand of the sea is like the seed of Abraham. And here's a, a parable of what they're supposed to do. They're also like the stars of the Shamayim. <clears throat> and the bright host of messengers and the intellectual Ruach Oath say to Palmoni, that's that wonderful number, okay? That was referenced in Daniel chapter 7. There is but one Kadosh being, and the set-apart seraphim, together with the six-winged cherubim, who sing to you their triumphal song, cry out with never-ceasing voices, Kadosh, 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 Yahuwah Elohim Zavaot, Shamayim wa Aretz are full of your esteem. Yes, Yahu 6.3. And the other multitudes of the orders, messengers, chief messengers, thrones, dominions, principalities, authorities, and powers cry aloud and say, Baruch be Yahuwah of esteem out of his place. Yehezkiel or Ezekiel 3.12. Even the principalities and powers cry aloud and say, Baruch be Yahuwah. If you've read the Ascension of Yeshiyahu, you'll see that the first level, there's also dissension and fighting going on because the prince of the principality and powers of the air is contesting with those higher up. But they've been kicked out since the coming of our Mashiach, and they can't go higher. They're stuck down here. So there's these things we'll get to in the course of time. We've also covered it little by little. If you want to go back to cover what we've read in the book of Hanok, it actually covers when they're cast out and how their peti their petitions are no longer allowed to be heard before the Father. But 
that was after his advent. We don't have that chronologically accurate there. And you can find that Satan even appears with the sons of Elohim during the festival days on the times where Yahuwah was coming and meeting with them in the book of Job. So he attacked his children. He always went to the heart of where his promise and his Baraka was going to go. That's where Satan attacks with everything he's got. And you can see that over and over again, the Garden of Eden. If you don't know, that was in Babylon. Um, that's for another time, though. The original was right at the southern part of where Babylon is, the heart of where perversion started, right? And then it was given to Shem, given to Abraham, the seed of Abraham. Over and over again, Satan goes after the seed, the promised seed to destroy the truth in the world. And you'll see that more as we go along. But it says, yet Yisrael, your assembly on earth, taken out of the nations, emulating the Shamayim powers night and day with a full heart, and a willing nefesh sings, the chariot of El is ten thousand full thousands of them that rejoice. Yahuwah is among them in Sinai, in the Kadosh. The Shamayim knows him who fixed it as stone in the form of an arch upon nothing, who united the land and water to one another and scattered the vital air all abroad and conjoined fire therewith for warmth and the comfort against darkness. Now, this part usually says a stone, of, a cube, a stone is a cube, a cube of stone, actually, like the Kabbalah. And that's the only reference anywhere in any writing that is considered scriptural or sacred that you find a cube of stone referenced in the shape of the Shamayim that I'm familiar with. But in many other references, it is made like an ice-like glass dome, like a like a snow globe, it's even referred to. And then awesome like crystal is also how it's referred to literally. So the I mentioned these because we don't know the exact word that was originally used here. I kept as stone, but I don't know. And I don't like to be dishonest about things. So it says, the Shamayim knows him who fixed it as stone in the form of an arch upon nothing, who united the land and water to one another and scattered the vital air all abroad and conjoined the fire therewith for warmth and the, the comfort against darkness. The choir of stars strikes us with admiration, declaring him that numbers them and showing him that names them parable of the children. The animals declare him that puts existence into them. The trees show him that makes them grow. All which creatures being made by your word show forth the greatness of your power. Wherefore, every man ought to send up a hem from his very soul to you through Mashiach in the name of all the rest, since he has power over them all by your appointment. And that's where man was made sovereign, if you will, under the common law. And we're all equals, children of Elohim, but having dominion on earth. For you are kind in your benefits and beneficent in your bowels of compassion, who alone are almighty. For when you will to be able is present with you, for your eternal power both quenches flames and stops the mouths of lions and tames wells and raises up the sick and overrules the power of all things and overturns the host of enemies and casts down a people numbered in their arrogance. You are he who are in Shamayim, who are on earth, who are in the sea. He who are in finite things, yourself unconfined by anything. For of your majesty there is no boundary. For it is not ours, Yahuwah, but the oracle of your servant who said, And you shall know in your heart that Yahuwah, your Elohim, he is El in Shamayim above and on earth beneath. And there is none other apart from you. Debarim or Deuteronomy 4.39 for there is no L apart from you alone. 
There is none set apart, apart from you, Yahuwah, the El of knowledge, the El of the Kodeshim, set apart above all set apart beings, for they are set apart by your hands. We can go over it more detail later on, but the Kodeshim are a literal group that we can see throughout the scriptures mentioned in the Proverbs, seen in the times of Daniel and elsewhere, but it's his Kodeshim. Don't you know that you'll be judges of over messengers, right? This is all talked about in different ways, but he is the Kadosh one over the Kodeshim, right? Who is an L of knowledge as we read in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? You are esteemed and highly exalted, invisible by nature and unsearchable in your judgments, whose existence is without want, whose duration can never alter or fail, whose operation is without toil, whose greatness is unlimited, whose excellency is perpetual, whose habitation is inaccessible, whose dwelling is unchangeable, whose knowledge is without beginning whose truth is immutable, whose work is without assistance, whose dominion cannot be taken away, whose monarchy is without succession, whose Malkuth is without end, whose strength is irresistible, whose army is very numerous. For you are the father of Chokma, the creator of the creation, by a mediator as the cause the bestower of providence, the giver of laws, the supplier of want, the punisher of the unrighteous and the rewarder of the righteous, the El and father of Mashiach and the master of those that are pious towards him, whose promise is infallible, whose judgment without bribes, whose sentiments are immutable, whose piety is incessant, whose thanksgiving is everlasting, through whom adoration is worthily due to you from every rational and set-apart nature. Yahuwah Almighty, you have created the world by Mashiach and have appointed the Shabbat in memory thereof, because that on that Yom you have made us rest from our works for the meditation upon your laws. You have also appointed festivals for the rejoicing of our inner beings, that we might come into the remembrance of that hokma which was created by you, how he submitted to be made of a woman on our account. The hokma from Elohim, which is Mashiach Yahushua, as it mentions in the epistles, right? He appeared in existence and demonstrated himself in his immersion. How he that appeared is both El and man. He suffered for us by your permission and died and rose again by your power. On which account we solemnly assemble to celebrate the feasts of the resurrection on Yahuwah's day. And rejoice on account of him who has conquered death and has brought Chaim or life and immortality to light. For by him you have brought home the nations to yourself for a peculiar people, a segula. The true Yisrael, beloved of El, and seen Elohim. For you, Yahuwah. Now, the true Yisrael, meaning the first was the physical, to teach as an example, and when our Mashiach came like one unto Moshe to, de to deliver them, it was from spiritual bondage, not the physical. And the ones that came out of that are the true Yisrael, the ones that he's been carrying down through history ever since, which should make more context or reason for why I say America and Britain and the common law countries of the world that oppose the canon law municipal code of Rome and Babylon. That's It's the two contrary laws that are ruling. But we've had a lot of usurpation or usurpation right now. So back on point. <clears throat> so 
Sorry about that. And seeing, it says, for by him you have brought home the nations to yourself for a peculiar people. The true Yisrael, those who strive with men in El and overcome, right? The prince of El. Beloved of El and seen Elohim. For you, Yahuwah, brought our fathers out of the land of Mitzrayim and delivered them out of the iron furnace from clay and brick making and redeemed them out of the hands of Pharaoh and of those under him and led them through the sea as through dry land and bore their manners in the wilderness and bestowed on them all sorts of tov or pleasant things. You gave them the laws or ten commandments, which was pronounced by your voice and written with your hand. You enjoined the observation of the Shabbat, not affording them an occasion of idleness, but an opportunity of righteousness for their knowledge of your power and the prohibitions of evils having limited them as within a set-apart circuit for the sake of doctrine, for the rejoicing upon the seventh period. On this account was there appointed one week and seven weeks and the seventh month and the seventh year and the revolution of these, the Yobel, which is the fiftieth year for remission that men might have no occasion to pretend ignorance. On this account, he permitted every, or he permitted men every Shabbat or to rest, that so no one might be willing to send one word out of his mouth in anger on the day of the Sabbath. For the Sabbath is the ceasing of the creation, this is a foreshadow of the millennial reign, okay? The completion of the world, the inquiry after laws, and the grateful praise to Eloa for the Baraka he has bestowed upon men. Prosperous will be those that live in those days. Yeah, they get to see the Tov of all Yisrael, it mentions in the Psalms. All which Yahuwah's day excels and shows the mediator himself, the provider, the lawgiver, the cause of the resurrection, the firstborn of the whole creation, El the Word and man, who was born of Miriam alone without a man, who lived Kadosh, who was impelled under Pontius Pilatus, and died and rose again from the dead so that Yahuwah's day commands us to offer unto you, Yahuwah, thanksgiving for all. For this is the favor afforded by you, which on account of its greatness has obscured all other birachot. You who have fulfilled your promises made by the foretellers, and has had loving kindness on Zion, and compassion on Yerushalayim, by exalting the throne of Dawid, your servant, in the midst of her, by the birth of Mashiach, who was born of his seed according to the flesh of a virgin alone. Do you now, Yahuwah Elohim, accept the prayers which proceed from the lips of your peoples, which are of the nations, which call upon you in truth, as you accepted of the gifts of the righteous in their generations? In the first place, you respected the offering of Abel and accepted as you accepted of the offering of Noah when he went out of the ark, of Abraham when he went out of the land of the Kazdim, of Yitzhak at the well of the oath, of Jacob in Bethel, of Moshe in the desert, of Aharon between the dead and the living. <clears throat> of Yahushua the son of Nun in Gilgal, of Gideon at the rock, and the fleeces before his sin, of Manoach and his wife in the field, of Shamshan, or Samson, in his thirst before the transgression. And if you don't know, you can look at it, Shamshun, his name actually means sunflower in Hebrew. Of Yephthah, 
right? Of Yetha. In the war before his rash vow, he was also of Manasseh, just like Gideon was uh, in the times of Judges, a type of what America would be. If you look at those stories, they're parables of our times, right? Of Barak and Deborah in the days of Sisera, of Shemuel in Mitzvah, of Dawid in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Yevusite, of Shalomo in Gibbon and in Yerushalayim, of Eliyahu in Mount Carmel, of Elisha at the barren fountain, of Yahushaphat in war, of Hezkiyahu in his sickness and concerning Sennacherib, of Manasseh in the land of the Kazdim after his transgression. And this is Manasseh, king of Yahuda, son of Hezkiyahu, just so you know. Okay. Of Yoash Yahu or Yoshiyahu in Pesach or Passover, of Ezra at the return, of Daniel in the den of lions, of Yonah in the whale's belly, of the three children in the fiery furnace, of Hanah in the tabernacle before the ark, of Nehemiah at the rebuilding of the walls, of Zerubbabel, of Matith Yahu and his sons in their zeal, of Yael in Birakoth. So Yael, if you don't know, I believe is that woman who, who helped with Sisera. But right here, they're saying that these are individuals whose prayers were answered. And this is mentioning specifically Matith Yahu and his sons, that would be Yahuda, Shimon, Yahukanon, and what we call the Maccabees. These men were acknowledged and commended for their zeal they were not condemned as reprobate or said to be apostate or usurping anything just for record there a lot of people have some wrong ideas because they believe things that people say rather than the historical records we can read for ourselves in the writings that we have that are the only records of the history we have for those times so these scholars that say they know things and they're promoting lies are only going off of stuff that you can read for yourself that will prove them wrong if anyone takes the time to do so. <clears throat> it says, now also do you receive the prayers of your tribes which are offered to you with knowledge through Mashiach in the Ruach. We give you thanks for all things, Yahuwah Shaddai, that you have not taken away your loving kindness and your compassions from us, but in every succeeding generation, you save and deliver and assist and protect. For you assisted in the days of Enosh and Hanak, in the days of Moshe and Yahushua, in the days of the judges, in the days of Shemuel and of Eliyahu and of the foretellers, in the days of Dawid and of the kings, and in the days of Esther and Mordecai, in the days of Yahudith, in the days of Yahuda Maccabeus and his brethren, and in our days have you assisted us by your great high Kohen, Yahushua Mashiach, your son. For he has delivered us from the sword, and has freed us from famine, and sustained us, has delivered us from sickness, has preserved us from an evil tongue. For all which things do we give you thanks through Mashiach, who has given us an articulate voice to confess with all, and added to it a suitable tongue as an instrument to modulate with all, and a proper taste, and a suitable touch, and a sight for contemplation, and the hearing of sounds, and the smelling of vapors, and hands for work, and feet for walking. And you form all these members from a little drop in the womb, and after the formation you bestow on it an immortal inner being, and produce it into the light as a rational creature, even man. You have instructed him by your laws, improved him by your statutes, and when you bring on a dissolution for a while, you have promised a resurrection. Wherefore, 
what life is sufficient, what length of ages will be long enough for men to be thankful. To do it worthily it is impossible, but to do it according to our ability is just and right. For you have delivered us from the impiety of polytheism and from the heresy of the murderers of Mashiach. You have delivered us from error and ignorance. You have sent Mashiach among us as a man, or among men as a man, being the only begotten El. You have made the Comforter to inhabit among us. You have set messengers over us. You have put the devil to shame. You have brought us into being when we were not. You take care of us when made. You measure out life to us. You afford us food. You have promised repentance. Esteem and worship be to you for all these things, through Yahushua Mashiach, now and ever, and through all ages. Amen. Meditate on these things, brethren, and Yahuwah am kam, or Yahuwah I am a kam, which is Yahuwah be with you. That is a saying first mentioned in Ruth chapter 2, verse 4, I believe, in the greetings with Boaz and the workers in the field. The workers, uh, or Boaz says, Yahuwah be with you. And they say, and Yahuwah barak you. Or, and he will barak you, Yahuwah, literally, right? <clears throat> but it says, And Yahuwah be with you upon earth and in the kingdom of his father, who both sent him and has delivered us by him from the bondage of corruption into his splendorous liberty, and has promised life to those who through him have believed in the El of the whole world. And then this is a footnote that I put afterwards mentioning uh, as a cube of stone, right, in that one section. But that was the totality of this. There's only a few parts that you can see that were really egregiously messed up, and the, the rest of this is rather wonderful. But I highly encourage you all, the more you study Scripture and read through it, and you look at these things, you'll see that this is just a wonderful compilation in the whole book. The entirety of the Apostolic Constitutions does a wonderful job of taking the embodiment, the totality of Scripture, and putting it in a comprehensible form. When you can remove the Catholic veneer that's been perverted onto it, and you only use what has demonstrable witnesses in Scripture built the way he said to, and you really use the backbone of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot that came beforehand, it is a wonderful addition. It is what we need to actually get things right before he returns is in this book. So the literal constitutions for his kingdom on earth and a foreshadow of what we are supposed to do like that is seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the Council of the Community and the dead, um, the community rule and the Damascus document and the, the laws and the things they had set up there was a microcosm or a type and shadow of what we should be doing because it was the true believers that separated themselves from the cities and removed themselves into the wilderness to keep the law where the offerings and sacrifices could not be established the way it was meant to anymore. They had to do things differently. And that's what those constitutions were in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The apostolic constitutions is just that, but full in its fullness with the, the fullness of the Besorah or good news being come in the advent of our Mashiach. So the idea of us doing these things and in the wilderness to prepare the way of Yahuwah before his coming, though, is exactly what happened before as a thing to teach us, if you've been following along, right? The physical firsthand, the spiritual later on. So thank you for all that. And um, I believe we might stop for comments and questions, right? So just give me a moment. All right, so we're doing a little Q&A afterwards and our brother asked about the wilderness experience that I had mentioned about the times that preceded the coming of our Mashiach and his advent with their 
separating from the cities and keeping the community rule, the Damascus document, the scrolls at Qumran and, and whatnot, and then the things that they did and how that translates to us in our times. If I could expound a little bit on that. The parallels, and this is the part, when you look into the coming of our Mashiach, the advent and the times around there, things are horrendously messed up on purpose because they don't want a clear picture for obvious reasons. If people were able to see clearly what was going on before his coming, they would be able to, to prepare and be act and know what's going on before his coming. But the more you can keep people in confusion, they can have eyes but not see and ears and not hear the things that are literally going on right in front of them. That's done through spiritual idolatry and other means. We can get into that part later. But the point is, there's a direct relation between the literal things that happened in the land there with the in infiltration of Edom into the kingdom and taking over, the foretellings being fulfilled of those times, the usurpation of the kahuna and its legitimacy after Herod took over the kingdom, not, not during the time of the Maccabees, but with the actual events we can read in the stories themselves, the, the things that really happened. Um, all of that stuff is muddied up, and none of it's in the official Bible, if you will, because they don't want us to know what it was like. But when you read it, and when you start looking at these things, the, the infiltration and usurpation of the lawful government of his people by Rome or Edom was preceding his coming. As that happened, men that wanted to keep to the truth came to the wilderness. That was foreshadowed in the separation of the reformers and eventually coming to America. And that's also possibly a type of our times now where you have the infiltration of our common law governments and people having to separate from that to keep his law like they wanted to again. But it's in those places that there's a, a shadow a type and picture of what was happening back then as well. That, that's the picture there. The apostolic constitutions was the fullness of the constitutions of his kingdom that was preceded as a, as a foreshadow in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we had no idea about until they were released in 1991. But if you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, right, if you click on... Um, There we go. You can go to community role, I believe it would be called. In the newer version, it's these are all the different scroll references, right? 1QS, 4Q255 through 64, right? And all the rest of these. Then you have the community rule manuscripts from K4. You have the Damascus document. This is the, the rules for keeping the covenant belief outside of the land where it had been perverted and man-made rules were being usurped and enforced upon the people instead. A type of things that are going on right now, if you guys can see that. But if you read these writings, the community rule and the Damascus document, the only differences in these writings and in what we can call the apostolic constitutions, aside from the perversions that have been added, the tampering that was done, the only differences is that this is pre-incarnate Mashiach. This is where things were still the bonded, the added transgression, or sorry, the added bonds because of transgression were still applicable. They had to do purgations and washings. They had other things that they were required by law. And those are no longer, no longer applicable for our times. It was part of the added bonds that are taken away in him, which is also covered in the apostolic constitutions. But <clears throat> that's, that's the gist of what I was talking about. You, you don't have a direct reference of these things anywhere it's that parallel of the microcosms of history and how they play out. 
when you look at the millennial reign, it was like the type of Dawid and Shalomo, where the beloved conquered all his enemies and reigned in his and his son or his children built the house right in shalom but it was a type of like the millennial reign in the same way the coming of our mashiach was a type of the advent of his coming so all of these things the coming out of babylon was like the reformation and coming out of mystery babylon that would happen later so the, these different things were echoes of of those things when it mentions in scripture, for example, that they are not Yahudim that are Yah, or they are not all Yisrael that are that are Israel, if you will. The distinction is you have the literal blood seed descendants who the promises were given to and all the covenants were ratified, and it's literally true for them. But you're cast off and cut off and divorced if you're apostate, right? It's about those that turn to obedience, right? Those that strive with men and Elohim and overcome whether they are the literal seed or those that join them and become one with them. A injunction in the law from the beginning. That's the point. And that is the fullness of the spiritual Israel, if you will, that was created when our Mashiach came as a type like unto Moshe. But, um, and that's why in his first coming, he came like Moshe and Yaakov in Moshe delivering the people from spiritual bondage and like Yaakov going outside of the land to labor for his possessions and, and, and everything that is his before returning to keep his vow, right? Um, now, in the Damascus document, or in one of these writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls, rather, it mentions that when they have a quorum of 15 men in the wilderness keeping the community rule, keeping this covenant, that would be the time where they were to send one out into the wilderness to proclaim to make straight the ways of Yahuwah. It's literally the written rule for when Yahu Kanan was supposed to go do the thing that he was sent to do. I don't know if you all are aware of that, but that it's literally found in there. And I thought that was pretty amazing too. Um, I'll try to find that if I can. I know it's easier to see, I believe, in the new translation. I don't know where it would pop up here though. But in the meantime, is there any other comments or questions or did I cover that rather well, brother? Yes, brother. That was great. I really appreciate it. Now, it, it is just a summary. If you really want to get the sense of what I mean and know for yourself, you, you have to read at least the community rule. And I'd read all of it, right? The Damascus document. I'd go ahead and go over all the, the, the laws and rules for the community, right? Which wasn't everything. But then, after you get that, then go through and read the Apostle of Constitutions and you'd see it. It's just a, one branching off from the other. And I encourage everybody who has any doubts about the... Um, about the... Um, excuse me. I lost my thing. There we go. Who has any doubts about the legitimacy of the Apostle of Constitutions to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls first, the community rule, the Damascus document, the laws of the altar and the things that they were meant to keep, the rules for the guardians of the communities and all of that stuff, and then look at the Apostle of Constitutions and you'll see it's just a segue from one to the other. And this one was the fullness of it because now he's come and the true light was now shining. So thank you all for your time. Um, you have a wonderful Shabbat, everyone on our Zoom and in the YouTube world there. Have a great rest of your week. Shabbat Tov, and we will see you next time.